Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Nora Kyle. And I am the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. I want to welcome you here. We have several people joining us. We know it's daylight savings, so we expect people to trickle in over the conversation. But we are happy to have you, whether you're here live or on the replay. And do we have any spiel we need to do today? We always need to do the spiel. So <laughs> allow me to spiel at you. So if you're watching us on YouTube, welcome. And if you have not subscribed to us, let me suggest to you, and this is only a suggestion, that it would be wonderful if you subscribe to us. A lot of people watch our videos. Not everybody subscribes. And each and every one of your subscriptions is a blessing to our channel because it gets us up in the uh, the weird algorithms of YouTube and uh, it will allow us to confound Google. And if you don't understand that, just go back and listen to some of our other videos because I've explained it in length. But we want to confound Google. Um, anyway, so subscribe and hit the the little bell down there and then hit this hit the alert button to let us know that uh, we can let you know when we put something up and what we would really love is a comment from you and a like a like and a comment we we want the comments because we want to know what you think and for this week only there is a special prize if you comment on this video, which is, we will reply to you at length, at nauseum sometimes. So you have that to look forward to. And if, <laughs> if, if you like, stop it. <laughs> if, you, if you like our video, hit the like button. Even if you don't like our video, hit the like button because that gets us up in the the, the YouTube um, algorithm as well, and more people will be able to find this video and be confounded by it. Lovely. I can't wait to confound that, Google. I do my best. All right, so do we have anything we need to, any updates? I think we're, we got it covered, right? I think we're good for the moment. Great. So this evening is kind of a story time, uh, kind of an exploratory one. We are going to be talking about a particular story that maybe some of you have heard before, but one thing we're going to learn is that Sufi stories can pop up anywhere. It's true. And they don't always have the stereotypical qualities. You know, the Sufi story where it's explicitly Sufi. And well, yet, this one actually is. It is. I just think it's so interesting that this story is so, it's everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, it really yeah. is. I, I have heard so many versions of this story in my life. Right, uh, yeah. I would bet you that Ilmar has heard this story in, in one of his native languages, mm -hmm. and probably Mustakim as well, and maybe yes. even Jayesh, because it gets around. Yeah. So we will be hearing a Sufi, you know, yeah. All the you're gonna, all, yeah 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 Sufi you're gonna hear the story that I originally learned way back in the early seventies before the fall of the Shah in Iran, yeah. uh, and probably because it was the first time I ever heard the story, it's always stuck with me as this is the best story. But there are plenty of good ones. So we have that. Um, um, drat, the, uh, the thing doesn't do ums. Let's learn to tune out the ums. Oh, are you, are you playing with the transcript? I was playing with the transcript. Anyway, so uh, we are going to tell you uh, this version of the story. And then we will discuss it. We may even lay it out on an Enneagram if we have the time, though I'm not sure that we'll be able to do it this time. We'll, we might do that in, in the forum because it's interesting to see this story laid out on an Enneagram. 
And if you like the story, make a comment down below. If you really like the story, tell us, and we'll do more of these weird special secret stories. Yeah, and you know what I would like to hear? I would love to hear if other people have heard this story, whether it's in yeah. English or in another, you know, another language. Where did they hear it? What language did they hear it in? All of that stuff. Yeah, I've heard this story in Farsi, in... Um, Kiswahili in Spanish and Portuguese and Italian and French and English, both British English and American English in a couple of different places. There is a southern version of the story and a northern version of the story uh, in the United States. And so it gets around. We'll give Chris a moment to get in, and then we will proceed. Ah. There he goes. So, once upon a time, long time ago, in the land of Persia, Mullah Nasiruddin was traveling. There was a bit of a famine going on at the time. There was not a whole lot of food. And Mullah, as he does, travels around yep. from place to place. And he comes to a village. And he thinks, ah, perhaps I can get a bite to eat and maybe even a place to sleep. So he goes into the village and he goes up to a house and he says, I'm wondering if you could share a little food with me and the people in the house they say no we we have no food at all we are we are starving here and he goes to every house in the village and asks the same thing and gets pretty much the same answer sometimes the answers are sad sometimes they're angry sometimes they're mean sometimes they are pitiful there are all these different answers but they amount to the same thing there's no food in the village and so Mullah goes to the center of the village and he shouts out, Oh, villagers, come and attend me. And the villagers come because they have nothing better to do than sit around and starve. And he says to them, I know that I have asked you for food. And since you have none, I will share my soup with you. I am going to make stone soup, which is an amazing dish. And the... Everybody looks at him like, he's crazy. You can't eat stone soup. And he says, but this is a special stone. First, bring me a large pot, a big pot, and bring me some water and some firewood. And so somebody brings a pot, and somebody brings some water, and somebody brings some firewood. And Mullen goes to his pack, and he pulls out this stone. It's a plain-looking stone. It does I mean, there's nothing special about it. And the Mullah says, some say that this stone is one of the original stones that built the Kaaba. Some say that this is the stone that Adam laid his head on when he was first created. I don't know if any of this is true, but I do know that this stone will make stone soup. So the mullah gently puts the stone in the pot, and he starts boiling it. And people are coming around and looking and saying, this guy is crazy. There is no way that he is going to get soup from a stone. Mullah tastes the stone. And he goes, yeah, it's getting there, but it needs a little something, perhaps some seasoning. Does anyone have a little bit of salt and pepper to put in the soup? And one woman says, I have a little bit of salt and pepper. And, and she brings it and they put it in. And while this is all going on, there's one boy, a young man, maybe 13 years old, thereabouts. And he's off and he's, he's hanging around, but he's not paying all that much attention. He's doing cartwheels and stopping to smell the flowers and doing all of the things that a, a somewhat distracted teenager might do. 
And occasionally he'll run up and sniff the pot and then run back. And everybody else, Mullah says, stay back from the pot because there is deep magic going on here. So they're all watching. And he tastes the soup again and goes, it's pretty good, but it needs some onion. Anybody got an onion? And Mullah gets somebody to bring him an onion or two and he chops it up and throws it in and he's stirring it more. And he tastes it again. And then he asks for a bit of chicken stock. <coughs> and somebody has some. And they bring it in. And the boy is now hanging from a tree, swinging back and forth, with a big grin on his face, watching everybody. Now, the mullah keeps testing the stew, sipping. Things. It could use a little bit of meat. Anybody got a little meat? And somebody brings in just some, some meat. And they put it in. And then some barley. And then some leeks, some carrots, some potato, all of these different things over the hours are being put into this stew. And Mullah is stirring and sniffing and nobody can see what's going on in the pot. But finally, the fire has died down, the soup has cooled off a little bit, and Mullah tastes it and he goes, the soup is ready. And he pulls out a cloth and he pulls the cloth over the top of the kettle. He says, one at a time, come up with your bowl, and this soup will feed everyone in the village. It's like magic. And so one person comes up, and Mullah just lifts up the cloth high enough to get his bowl in there. He scoops out a bowl of the soup, pours it into the person's bowl, and this goes on over and over and over again till every villager has a full bowl of soup, big bowl of soup, not stingy soup, but big, generous soup. And the little boy, the boy that was watching is the last one who comes up. And Mullah says, okay, one more for you. And he scoops it up and he pours the soup and the rock comes in with it. And the Mullah says, aha. Aha! So the boy has the soup with the rock in it. And Mullah takes one more scoop and pulls the, uh, the cloth off of the top of the kettle. And it's empty. It's amazing. That stone made all of that soup. It was like a miracle. And everybody ate their soup and they agreed that it was the most wonderful soup that they had ever had. And the boy is sitting there playing with the rock. And people bring out, you know, drums and ouds and whatever they have, and they're singing and they're dancing together in the, the town square, having a good time. And Mullah gets the boy to come over to him. And they're talking and they're talking very quietly together. They talk like that for half the night. And then the mullah finds a place to sleep and he sleeps and the next morning he calls everybody together and he says in this night i have taught uh, this boy how to make stone soup using the magic stone and from now on he's going to be in charge of this and as long as you listen to him this pot will never be empty and then mullah went on his way walking down the uh, down the street and he could he could hear the boy saying I think it needs a little salt and as he was going out he looked down on the ground and saw a beautiful stone and he picked it up and put it in his pack for the next village and that's the story of stone soup <sighs> what do you think I know it's a little bit different than most of the versions that you've probably heard, but I like this one. By the way, uh, this, is, this thing with the cauldron and the cloth over it, in Farsi is called digjush, which means boiling pot. And it is a part of a traditional Sufi uh, initiation ceremony. When uh, a person becomes a Sufi in many of the Iranian orders, they are, uh, they will put on a feast. Uh, and 
the people will bring all sorts of food to the feast, much like in this story. Um, and the sheikh will, will cook the food. And at the end of it, he does the thing with the cloth. And he puts it over and he reaches in and gives everybody a bit of what's in the pot. And 100% of the time, there's always just enough and a little leftover. It's like magic. So remember that, dig jush. If Zainab were here, I could get her to tell us about it, but she isn't, so we miss you, Zainab. So what do you think? What does this story mean? What does it tell us? And they all start staring at him silently. Sometimes people think they have nothing, but what's needed is a catalyst. Yes, mm -hmm. this is very true. There is a one of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad is, the food of one is enough for two. The food of two is enough for three. And that goes back to this story. Definitely though, Nancy, thank you. Welcome. The queen. The young boy whose mind wasn't spoiled by the worries of life and was energetic and had a positive attitude. He's the one who gets taught and is the future food for the tribe. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you look at his qualities, uh, they are the, the, the qualities of what it takes to actually teach somebody to do this kind of magic. You have to be a bit of a mountebank, a clown, as it were. And the boy was the one non-serious person in the village. And it, probably the only one who got the joke. Davida, what do you think? I'm thinking that we have more together than we do separately. Yes. As a community. That is a very Absolutely important part true. of the story. Yeah. Definitely. Did your camera die? I had some weird technical, it just like shut off figuring it out don't worry i'm not worried david what do you think um i really like the point about community um but other than that i've i've got uh nothing nothing so far well if you get the community part that's enough Mr. King, how about you? Yes, I, I think uh, also about the community that uh, people uh, there, there is there's there's uh, more in 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 community than just uh people alone yes have you ever heard this 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 story in indonesian no i don't i don't think i the mm. same story no not not in the first okay. indonesian then it may be your job to tell it <laughs> <laughs> okay I'll, 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 yeah I'll, I'll create one in indonesian <laughs> yeah, there, that's, that's, awesome. that's all that's all it takes. Yeah. And there are parts of the story that I kind of left out. Um, for instance, when Mullah Nasruddin had everybody around and they were all looking at him, he knew that they had to be distracted from both the growling of their tummies and their wondering what was going on in the pot. So he taught them to do a zikr. 
mm. according to the story that as I heard it the first time, he had everybody going, la ila ila la, the whole time. So they were focused on uh, no God but God while he was making his stew. And that distracted them from noticing uh, that there was magic going on. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's a kind of important one. Yeah. Mm, that's an important yeah, I detail. I figured I, I have to tell you about that if nobody else, because <laughs> you will understand that. Okay, yes, I understand that. Thank you. And I okay. love the point you made about um, community. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a side project where I'm studying um, Islamic gift economy, which is about like creating a, a real community instead of a crowd. So people are invested in one another. Whereas crowds are just like random people just, just there as opposed to being invested in a sense of togetherness where you can count on one another. Yeah. So thank you for, for alluding to that. Did you want to, shall we call on Jayesh? Yes, we should. Mostly everything, everybody has said something. So, but I didn't get the magic part that why uh, that soup was sufficient for the entire tribe. Because everybody from it added a little bit. And the thing is with soup, all it takes is a little bit of everything to make a decent soup. It was enough because everybody joined in. Have you heard that story before, Jayesh? Or some version of it? Yeah, we, we have another version of the story in the uh, Mahabharata. It is called Akshay Patra. And uh, when it is a long story, but Pandavas in a uh, forest and Lord Krishna gave a uh, vessel to the Pandavas and then food will not get empty from this uh, bowl. And the story goes very long, but yeah. Yeah. similar kind of. Yeah, it, that may actually be the origin of the story because so far, I mean, the, the Gita is the oldest, or that would actually not be the Gita, that would be the whole uh, Mahabharata is, is Mahabharata. very, very old uh, literature as opposed to the version that uh, the story that I have is maybe only a thousand years old. So that's interesting that that might be the origin of the story. I like that. Thanks, Jash. How about who have we not heard from? We haven't uh, heard from Ilmar. He's Ilmar, sitting here yeah. Contemplative. <laughs> uh, contemplative. No, actually, I had not heard the story before. Though, it, though, it, there's a certain sort of resonance to it, which makes me think that at some level, maybe I had. But I, I guess that's kind, of, that's kind of the magic of. The we what what these days is called the we space, you know, where there's a communal um, symbiotic sort of uh, creation uh, created, and and there are other stories that I've heard that are that speak to that. You know, the, the whole notion of we space is pretty pretty new, at least by that term, it's fairly new. But so. So maybe, so I wonder if it, you know, I, I'm, in fact, I, I'm curious whether this resonates with some sort of more archetypal uh, thing that a lot of us share in our sort of subconscious and stuff, you know. But, but though I had not heard this particular story before, and as far as I know, there is not a Latvian version of it, but then, yeah. I don't know. Which I, have heard, <laughs> I, have, I have heard a Lithuanian version of it that involved... Yeah? Uh, okay. Yeah, and it was a, a small group of soldiers who came to the town looking for food and a place to eat. Hmm. I got this from a very beautiful young Lithuanian girl who came to the United States to recover from being struck by lightning. Hmm. 
Well, if it's a Lithuanian version, there's probably a Latvian version too, then. Yeah. Because uh, they sort of feed off each other, basically. But um, I, I know, since I didn't grow up in a Latvian community, you know, I probably missed out on that. You know, but, yeah. yeah. The, the story keeps popping up. And as, as Jayesh pointed out, I mean, you find it in the Mahabharata of all places. And that was written, what, over 2,000 years ago? Probably why longer it, than that. Well, why does it keep popping up? It must keep popping up because, I mean, I'm, I've recently been, you know, especially intrigued by archetypal sort of stuff. And I wonder if it keeps popping up because it resonates with something that's fairly central to, to what? To, yeah, to, yeah. to community, to generosity, yeah. Yeah. to yeah. gratitude, to all of these things yeah. that people really benefit from having. Mm -hmm. And it's probably something that you're seeing going on in Ukraine right now. You know, I mean, they're yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, people are definitely doing that sort of thing right now. And uh, yeah, it's it it makes for interesting things. You the know, story what I kept does hearing as a kid, which doesn't quite resonate in this way is you know hey they're out of food but we have you know one smoked fish so we hang it from the ceiling and everybody sort of scrapes their bread against the smoked fish and uh, yeah. that's weird. but that doesn't have quite the same resonance and doesn't quite have the same mark. yeah yeah this is this is not one house usually this is one right. village right so one person has a smoked fish, another person has some bread, another person has some butter, and the next thing you know, you have a meal. That's right. Thanks so much. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And one part of this story that you don't find in a lot of the stories that I've heard is the part about the little boy. Yeah. I mean, when I heard it, it, on. Yeah. it didn't include that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the idea of the experience of making the soup is initiatory in, in a certain way. And the one kid who is uh, grooving on what's going on in his own way rather than being uh, just focused on the soup becomes the one who is initiated into the making of the soup. The secret of creating generosity in the community. So we have a couple of people with their hands up. I want to make sure yes. we catch them. Um, Get everybody. Levita. Yeah. So we have Levita and McQueen. Levita, what are you thinking about? I was thinking that um, in every community I've ever participated in, there is a tradition. I know in the United States, it's frequently called a covered dish or a potluck where mm -hmm. a group of people will get together and they'll be like, everybody bring hot and cold, a hot and a cold dish, or just something enough for your family, one dish. And then um, everybody does that. And what you wind up with is groaning tables of food. Like there's so much food left over that people are like, I can't take this home. Like everybody starts taking home one another's things because they don't want theirs back. And it's strange because people only brought enough to feed their family. So like in my family, there were eight people. So I'd make enough, whatever, to feed eight people. But it's somehow, by the time everybody brings enough for their family, it feeds everybody with food left over. So it, it sounds like that's kind of it's not the exact same thing, but it's that it's same. Close it's close enough. It's close enough. Yeah, it's got that spirit to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, like the the idea of potluck here is, I think, one of the cooler traditions we have. Um, back when I had a formal martial arts school, and this was in Southern Oregon, we did a potluck the whole class every week. Once a week, it's like bring whatever food you want. I'll cook a main dish. Everybody bring everything else. And it was the groaning table, you know, about 12 people. And we feasted and hung out for hours talking and having a good time. Um, awesome. 
and it built really strong community. That's the thing. That's why we always talk about like when community often involves sharing food, especially in the Sufi tradition. That's oh yeah, that's a big Sufis deal. Sufis are big on eating. Yeah, every place I've ever been around the world, from Indian Sufis to Egyptian Sufis to Turkish Sufis to um, whatever flavor you got, there is food. <laughs> there is definitely food. Yeah. Omar, did you have something you wanted to quickly add? Yeah, I mean, you know, another sort of central aspect of this whole story is that, that it needs an evoker of the community spirit. I mean, the community, of course, was there long before Mr. Gatim uh, entered the village, right? But they couldn't come together until there was like an evocateur of that community spirit. And that's the learning or the initiation essentially that gets passed on to the young boy is the capability to do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Point. yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, McQueen, what were you going to say? Oh, you're you going to unmute. There you go. I was going to say pretty much what Ilmar was saying there that uh, they didn't need food. The food came from the village. They were all fixated on their stomachs. They didn't need food. They needed each other. Yeah. And each one of them was sitting in their own home feeling pitiful because they didn't have enough to eat. To the point where they lost their uh, ability to provide hospitality for a stranger, which in that part of the world is a big thing. You know, the uh, hospitality is something that is taken very, very seriously in uh, older cultures. And I remember uh, being invited to a friend's home for dinner uh, when I was living in Tanzania. And, you know, he worked as a sort of a do-everything person. Uh, for a, a little store down below where I lived, probably made uh, $10 a week doing the work. And I, he, he brought me to his house, his wife and his kids, and they produced what for them was a feast. I'm looking at it and went, it cost $10 just to cook this meal. And... You know, they made sure that I had the most food. I mean, I didn't want to eat the most food, but they made sure that I ate the most food. And it was beans with a little meat and some ugali, which is um, stiff corn uh, mush and uh, fresh squeezed uh, papaya juice because the papayas grow on trees there. You can pick them and eat them. Okay. And it was, a, it was an amazing feast and there wasn't much to it, but when you think this was a week's salary for one meal, uh, that's mostly because of the cost of the meat, that's, that's hospitality for you. generosity, yeah, deep generosity. Uh, Tanzania, I used to live in Arusha, which is a, a town in the Northern part of Tanzania near Kilimanjaro. Um, we have not heard from Jonathan or Chris, right? Yeah, Jonathan, you're so quiet today. Yeah, yeah, I, I had an interpretation, and my feeling was there was no famine in this village, that there was always an abundance of food. But the idea of the famine was people's lack of ability to share. If I think of the street where I live, everyone in the street has a car, and some people have two cars. There's probably 50 cars in the street. I bet you if we got rid of 30 of them and just had a parking lot where all the, the remaining 20 cars are parked, and everyone gets to pick whatever car they need whenever they need it, there'd be more than enough cars with those 20 cars to serve all the people in the street. 
but people don't want to share their car. Never to nobody. Make some very interesting yeah. points. Yep. And that reminds me, Jonathan, I didn't get a chance to reply to your query today, but uh, the answer will be, I will contact you privately about it. Oh, thank you. How about you, Chris? Oh, Jonathan, I'm sorry. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I no, no, no. no. Okay, cool. Chris. I didn't have anything new to add. I was just really struck by the fact that uh, the way in which he engaged was developing the capabilities of the community to provide for themselves <clears throat> and then also to help the next travelers who come through with that hospitality. So nothing new to add, just a yeah. wonderful story. Yeah, but for the kind of work that you're doing, it's a great reminder. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, so I one thing that like before when we talked about this uh, the other day when we were preparing for this, what immediately came to my mind was when I heard this story originally, it was like a trickster story. So it didn't have the character Nasruddin. Uh, it didn't have the character of the boy. It was kind of like a trickster story in the sense of like I going to fool these people into sharing their food not only with me but with their community from whatever they're either hoarding or protecting for themselves yeah this was totally a trickster story too Nasser yeah. Adin is the archetypal the, yeah, trickster in absolutely yeah. yeah but he is coyote he is yeah. <laughs> yes in in the way that you described it, I feel like there was there wasn't like a snideness to it, you know. No. I have heard it told in such a way that there was kind of like a yeah a teasing pull the wool over to the it. eyes with these dumb villagers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've heard it told, yeah. told that way too, but that's one of the reasons I like um, my version. I yeah I I was pleasantly surprised by this version. Yeah. It has a delicateness to it. Yeah. And the initiatory part uh creating the boy as the master of the boiling pot uh I think is is an it's either an addition to the story or it's part of the story that was lost that is really potent because it's the idea of transmission how do you transmit this to other people because nasruddin can't be back every week to trick them yeah he has to figure out how to give them that constant uh catalyst as nancy was saying to get out of their own heads <laughs> yeah and he's looking at this boy going yeah, he, he is the fool. He is the Montebank. He is the one who is spinning while everybody else is doing the zikr. He's, um, you know, he's lost in the ecstasy of the moment and therefore the perfect person to learn to do this for everybody else. Because in order to do this, right, you have to entertain the crowd. That's true. Yeah, if you got some old grumpy guy to do this, if you told him the secret of how to do it, first of all, the guy would go, oh, you tricked us. And he wouldn't wouldn't want to do it. And then he would try and do it. And everybody would look at him and go, what the hell, dude? We aren't going to give you our stuff. So you have to channel Mullah Nasruddin or Coyote or Raven or Spider or any of the other tricksters. I guess that's actually my curiosity. I mean, what, what is the essential skill that Nasruddin had and that he passed on that was able to create this communal um, integration, essentially? Yeah. And part of it seems to be a certain lightness of touch almost. You know? uh, yeah. But I wonder what else is involved. I mean, what, you know, um, if you were to teach someone to be 
uh, the community builder like that. What would you you have to get the entire community to have the same intention. And the and intention you... was to have this giant pot of soup. And you might do that through storytelling while you're making the soup. Mm -hmm. uh, any number of things. Again, you know, teaching these folks how to do zikr so that they have a way to focus their intention on what's going on. But when they are focused on the pot being full of a really delicious soup made from stone, then they don't think about, oh, I need to donate a couple of carrots, or I need to donate a potato, or I need to donate this piece of beef, or this lamb, or this chicken, or any of these other things. They think about the outcome, not the process of getting there, because the process of getting there is asking them to do something that they wouldn't normally do, which is share with each other. They'll learn the process through experiencing the outcome. But in the beginning, you have to break through that conditioning of stinginess. Right. But, but, and, and, and it seems like it requires a certain way of presenting it. If I, if yes. the guy just presented a recipe, for example, saying, okay, we need the too many carrots and the set on him, put them together, probably nothing would have happened, right? But it was no. a skillful presentation of it. Via yeah, story. presentation is everything. Any cook knows that. You can make the best tasting meal in the world, and if it looks like shit, people are not going to eat it. So presentation is everything, and what you are presenting is not soup. You're presenting stone soup, Stu soup made from a magical stone, which may be the stone upon which Adam laid his head on the first night that he slept. It may be the stone from the original Kaaba, that um, Abraham built uh, uh, after he had found his way to that land. It may be a stone that fell from the sky as a meteorite. It could be all of these many magical things, but the most magical thing is this stone can be made into soup. So that is the skillful means by which this is accomplished. And it works really only in a society which still in some sense believes in magic, right? If you were to do that to the, uh, you know, assembled professors in some uh, uh, university, it would never have worked, right? Not in that way. You would have to choose another set of metaphors. Right. right. But so you, you can find those metaphors. Yeah. I mean, that's what skillful means is, right? You know your audience and you know how to catalyze them and so that's my challenge to everybody who listens to this and if you're listening to this if you've made it this far i would like you to comment down below if you were to use this story today in the way that it's meant to be used what are the metaphors that you would use all of them will be valid in some place at some time so what are the metaphors that you would use where you live um to make this story work, to create community, to feed the people and create community. Uh, it's not necessarily about food, right? To, uh, to find it's the next It's not about food, yeah. but food helps. Food helps a lot. It's to find the needs of the community and then yeah. try to understand what they need. Yep. But yeah, and to get the entire community working together to fulfill those needs. Because where one person can't do much, 10 people can do it. And that's that part of the message of the story is if 10 people have the 10 ingredients necessary to make stone soup, they all share them, you get the stone soup. Ash. Yeah, so uh, individual consciousness uh, gives contraction, and it's a feature of ego. And collective consciousness gives expansion, which is the form of love. So uh, like uh, one person can do one thing or cannot do one thing, but then 10, 10 people can come together as a team and they can create a miracle. Absolutely.
Yeah, and I'm going to have to go back and find that section in the Mahabharata and read how Krishna dealt with this because there will be answers in that. In the story, it goes like uh, the lady, the wife of five Pandavas, Draupadi. Mm -hmm. the, yes. the message was that, that until Draupadi eats from that bowl, food will be there. But once Draupadi eats, then there would not be any further food coming out from that bowl. And uh, they were staying inside forest and a large uh, community of uh, monks uh, with uh, leader Rushi Durvasa visit to the visit to them and somehow they knew that Draupadi has eaten the he's eaten her uh, part of the meal from the bowl so there would not be any food in the bowl uh, and then he was a very uh, angry sage and he could curse Pandava like anything but then uh, last moment Draupadi prayed to Lord Krishna and Krishna came and asked her that there is one uh, one particle of rice which is sticking in that bowl. And you, uh, Krishna, you give me that particle and Krishna ate that one particle of rice and then entire community of that, those monks or sages were fulfilled. And uh, they actually didn't come to eat, but they ran away actually, because they, they understood <laughs> that, that if we go and if we don't eat, then we will get cursed. <laughs> that is a story. Yeah. But, that, yeah, that, that definitely there must be a sounds deeper, like deeper it's... meaning of this story. Uh, like this is a this is a mythological part, but there, there must be a deeper meaning of the story. Yeah, spiritual uh, meaning. There is definitely some some heavy meaning to that story. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, like the uh, if consciousness uh, uh, is fed, like our attention, we give attention to our consciousness. Then uh, there is so much nourishment we get from within. Uh, from even one one little moment of consciousness, it fills up everything. Yeah, maybe uh, that, <laughs> that Thanks, works Chad. for me. I I have a feeling that we will find many layers of profound truth in that story if we start taking it apart. And it 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 tickles me pink to realize that this story is in the lineage of, of the uh, the stone soup story and may actually be the origin of it. It's certainly the oldest account I know of. Uh, like I said, I did not know of an account that was older than about 900 to 1000 years and uh, Mahabharata is much, much older than that. Couldn't hear you. It's very old, actually. It's a uh, very, very ancient text of, and Mahabharata contains uh, all the mostly uh, spiritual truths written yep. in a mythological form. Yep, I managed to make it through reading it once, and that was like a lot. <laughs> Long, <laughs> yeah, in in English, it's like six volumes. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of story. A lot of. Story. So anyway. Thanks, Jayash. We have, uh, Lavita has her hand up. Yes, Lavita. Um, I, I was thinking as you guys were talking and I realized I have, I've actually, I've heard that story before, but not with the little boy, the stone soup story. But yeah. another story that parallels it is um, the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Yes. And a lot of people forget that what he said was everybody bring what you have and they had a little bit and then he distributed it and everybody was fed. Um, Thank you for reminding us of that because yeah, that's, that was kind of yeah. like percolating in the back of my mind too, actually. So I'm glad you, you brought that to the front. Um, but what I originally raised my hand for <laughs> was because Sheree. it occurred to me as we were talking that you know, he came to the village and he asked people if they had any food because he was hungry. And when he pulled out the stone and did the stones and, and created the stone soup, he actually gave more than he received because he didn't eat until the last person ate. And he got the last serving. So, you know, he produced 
how many servings of food, you know, so their reward for their hospitality was they all got well-fed, not just like you said, it wasn't a stingy, thin bowl of gruel. It was a filling, hearty bowl of soup. Um, and the second thing, and this is a question, in that story, I don't remember hearing it, but it might have been, and I might have just zoned out. Did anyone thank Nazaruddin? Um, I am sure that they all did, but it wasn't part of the story as I heard it. It may be part of that story now. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. And the, the, the little boy part is, uh, it's hard to find in the story, but we see it in the story of, uh, from the Mahabharata, though it wasn't a boy, it was the, the wife of the five Pandava brothers. Don't get any ideas, Noor. <laughs> yeah, she had five husbands. <laughs> each one cooler than the next. <laughs> but I think that, that she represented the one who was initiated. And that pops up several times in the account. I mean, Krishna comes and protects her when people are trying to humiliate her and all sorts of things. So there was a special connection there uh, that I sometimes think gets uh, overlooked. And... Uh, so I think that might be the origin of the little boy. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to go check that out. Thanks, Lavita. That, that was all uh, good stuff to point out. Nancy, I see you. Uh, do you have something to share? Yeah. Um... A few things. One is, um, I think I saw it as a children's book, and this is the first time I've heard it to told. Um, yeah, it's it's showed up as a children's book several times. Yeah, and I was interested because I think the version I heard starts with onions rather than salt and pepper, and I was thinking it was interesting that Nasreddin starts with a very small ask. Yes. And also that it, it starts with the vision of there being enough soup rather than telling people you have enough. Um, because if he just said you have enough, uh, they wouldn't have listened. Yeah, it's true. He had to trick them. And you're, you are absolutely correct in it started out with a very, very small ask. And the thing is, once you agree, it's easier to agree the next time. And this goes back to uh, the question that you were asking, asking Nancy about uh, uh, truth and, and lies and why one rather than the other. Um, once you get somebody to uh, agree with you, and you get them to agree with you three or four times, the next time you ask, do you think they're more or less likely to agree with you? Oh, obviously more likely. Yeah. So if I tell you three things that you know is true, that you can demonstrate to yourself is true, and then I tell you something that maybe you can't demonstrate in the moment as true, are you more or less likely to believe that thing? Mm -hmm. And that's the the secret to uh, why it is that you have to ignore the truths to see the lies. And that's a whole different thing. If you were in the nine-sided circle group, if you were in our forum group, you would understand exactly what we were just talking about. But since you're not, I'm sorry. Wait. Yes. Yeah, but you know, anyone can show up there and yeah, that we invite you. Just yeah. answer the damn questions when you when you sign up. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm about to I'm about to deny like six people entrance into the group because they've ignored the request to just answer the questions. And it's very sad. It hurts Pesky. my feelings every it time sucks. I do that. Yeah. She'll, Nor will tell you I cry. There are tears. There's weeping. I have to go click. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So you can say, slipped away. What were you going to tell you? Nancy, did you have any anything else you wanted to to offer? Um. I, well, actually, a couple of things. One is that even paying attention to a direction and following it is a sort of generosity. But I'm not even. I'm not sure how we get people to extend that generosity. Yeah, actually, Levita just offered the same thought, a similar thought, yeah. at least. She says, if they can't follow directions, they won't make good students of any sort. Yeah, and that's true. You guys are spot on. Yeah. Oh, and here's one that, what the hell, I'm going to say it now when the recording's on. <laughs> sure. And I was listening to this discussion and realizing to the extent that, let us say, I've been getting trained to mistrust anything Christian. And this is rough on community. The extent yeah, it, to which it's people well can be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this talk is about community, but it, it leads towards what tends to damage community. Yep. And I understand. I, I have the same impulse uh, for any number of reasons that we don't need to go into. Um, just mention missionaries around me sometime, though, and stand back. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the, my teacher cured me of that by sending me when he got requests from Christian churches to send somebody to talk about Islam or things that were going on in the world, of which there was a lot. Um, I would be the person that he would send, even though he knew that I had a pretty strong antipathy towards Christianity. And, uh, you know, almost always I was welcomed into that community in whatever church. And there were like Methodists and Baptists and you know, Lutherans and all of that, even High Church, Church of England, but in Australia. One of the most fun times I ever had talking to Christians was in Melbourne, Australia with my buddy, Sheikh Ibrahim. We were sent to Australia to talk about stuff and we talked at length at this church and they asked us interesting questions and really made us feel welcome. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, that antipathy towards Christians is something that we all have to get old, uh, over because some of them are nice. Yeah, it's not, we all have to get over it. I mean, part of my situation is I didn't grow up with it. I didn't have it for a long time. It is the modern world that's been trained, the recent world that's been training me in it. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, I heard a lot of uh, anti-Semitic shit in churches when I was mm -hmm. a kid. You know, the Jews killed Jesus. And <laughs> yeah, after them relating the story and going, what, what about these Roman guys? You know, but... Yeah. And what about the very bad habit of bringing the past into the present? Yeah, that one too. What about... Yeah, nobody was alive when this happened. You know, there is nobody alive who was responsible for anybody's death 2,000 years ago. So, learning to let go of that while still realizing that in some areas of every religion um, can be unpleasant. I mean, I rarely go to the mosque, even for Juma prayer, because not looking like I'm an Arab uh, or whatever flavor of mosque it is, and all of the mosques are always a particular ethnicity in America. You know, you have, you know, the various Arab mosques, Shia and Sunni, you have the Pakistani mosques, you have the Indian mosques, and the Indian mosques hate the Pakistani mosques. Um, and, you know, all these different mosques, and they're all 
these tiny little things. And if you are not part of the in-group, you don't feel welcome in a lot of them. Yep. And there's a, a possibly smaller thing, you know, you're talking about how sharing food increases community, but we've reached a point, at least in America, where so many people are aware of which foods are bad for them. It, be, it makes hospitality much harder. Yeah, not impossible, but a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Because you can always make salad. <laughs> the standby. Oh, there are people who are yeah. allergic to onions, to peppers. I mean, that just takes into consideration, you know, again, your audience who's going to be there as, as well as you can be attuned to that or investigate beforehand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we have, Levita has her hand up and David says, we passed this topic, but the boy doesn't follow the directions of the crowd following along with what they're doing. And that makes him the student who is good enough to carry on the stones to soup magic. Yes. And in order to understand this, I recommend that everybody here, and I'll put a link up, one of these places, <laughs> uh, watch the video that we did on sacred clouds. That is relevant to this conversation. Yeah, for it sure. is relevant to this conversation because the sacred clown is the one who operates outside the system in order to make the system work. And this, this is a case of that. So sacred clowns, uh, there will be a link at the end of this video. If you get all the way to the end, you find the link. And if you don't get all the way to the end, you'll be wondering what the hell I'm talking about. So get all the way to the end. And you'll enjoy it. Which should be coming up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Levita. Okay, I'm finding I can't write fast enough. Okay. Oh, no. um, I, I was thinking about that whole Christianity thing. And I will admit that I have a bias myself for reasons I won't get into. Um, but I was thinking about that lovely quote that um, Nancy dug up a few weeks back that talks about remaking God in your own image. Like, you know, you've done that when he hates all the same people you do. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think that's where no matter what religion you're encountering or interacting with, your listening skills are so critical like what's being said, what's not being said, because in every group of, every spiritual group, there are the people who are doing their best to embody the principles of that group. And then there are people who are like, they've turned it into their own special prison and they want you to join them in the prison. And if you don't join them in the prison, you're a bad person and you're an enemy. So we got that. Um, as far as the hospitality goes, I, I agree with Nancy because I've got some, I, I, I don't consider it a heavy duty food allergy in the sense of um, I can avoid it at home, but it is in the sense of it's in everything when you leave the house. So, I mean, I'm thinking as a host, it can be difficult. Like Nancy said, it, it can be difficult, it, but it does require some thought and it can be overcome. Like for example, everything's a buffet, sauces, and ingredients are all separated and you can put what you want on your food or whatever. Yeah. I mean, for some things, obviously some stuff, it's not gonna work. But if you have something available like that, and as a guest, my attitude is if I go someplace, I, I always am like, if I go someplace, I'm not going out to a restaurant to eat because I need food. I've got food at home. I'm going for the company. So if they don't have anything I can eat, you know, I'll get a glass of water or something and, and I'll just enjoy the company. And that keeps me from having a really nasty attitude because I have to admit, it's not much fun watching other people eat when you ain't yeah. eating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, I've had it happen once or twice where, you know, people knew I had allergies, but they thought, you know, if they took mayonnaise off the menu, that would be okay. And it was like, 
(laughs) So I couldn't eat anything. And I was like, you know, but um, I've got food at home. If I had wanted just to eat, I wouldn't have come out here. Yeah. You know, and that helped them feel a little bit better about, you know, stuff. So yeah, and it, is, in the the days where there was actually hospitality, uh, a host would would notice and know this. Mm-hmm. And you know, in the old days, it's like I'm, I'm sorry, I can't eat this food. It's it's it would make me sick, or it's against my religion. The host goes out and um, gets something else, and at the same yeah. time, the guest, if it's not going to make them sick, even if it's against your religion it is more important to be hospitable than it is to avoid the bacon. Right. Right. Nowadays, they don't understand this, but. Yeah. I mean, I've had both, both ends where it's been like, somebody literally was like, I prepared, I got, I made this special dish just for you. And I was like, didn't want all of that. And then there were other places where it was like, well, if you can't eat this, then just too bad. You just don't eat, you know, like that really callous attitude which I was very grateful to know about that person up front. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, that's tough. Thanks, Lovita. Jay, I should see you have your hand up. So famine is required to have a stone shoe because if there was no famine, Mullah could have got food from the first house and there was no need to create stone shoe. So if there is a challenge in our life, there is an opportunity to create a stone soup kind of situation. That is indeed the case. Oftentimes people don't change until the pressure is on them. Yeah, so that's a very, very good point. Without the, without the, the famine, there would have been no stone soup. Something to think about the next time you find that there are troubles in your life. You can ask, how can I make stone soup out of this? All right, any last thoughts or questions before we wrap this sucker up and put a bow on it? Like we're good. Okay, well then I'm gonna switch Brady over to Bunch Brady Bunch Mo. I wanna say hi to Sheree. Just I know she yes. came in. Hello, late, Sheree. But, um, we'll, we'll say hello to her, her after too. There you are. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wait to everyone who's watching on the replay and to each other. And we and will see you, you all next week. See you next time. Yes, fist bumps. Which will be even more fun <laughs> and have more to do about stories and the structure of creating them. Yes, storytelling. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we'll look forward to that. Take Bye. care.